Okay. We are live. Yes. Good. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Happy Friday. Happy November. Happy 2021. Happy uh, anything else going on? Happy whatever you're doing. Happy that. Uh, this is Cloud English Live. We're going to be uh, looking at some interesting topics today. I'm going to be sharing some videos as I've been doing recently so that we can look at uh, pronunciation, practicing a bit of pronunciation and some other small things as well. And Q&A. So if you have questions about idioms and phrases, pronunciation, grammar, whatever it may be, ask away. Ask your questions. I'm happy to answer. That's what we're here for. Let's see what else. Um, still have the holiday sale going on. Black Friday is coming up. So if you are potentially interested in getting serious about your English, taking English courses, I'm going to recommend the um, yearly membership of Cloud English. You can click that in the link. If you click the link, that'll take you to the website. Then below that, there's a discount coupon code, which you can put in at checkout, and that will give you 50% off the yearly membership. Part of that membership includes, for example, if you need help from me as you're going through courses, these are all my courses. If you need help from me going through my courses, you can always get in touch. I'm a very helpful person. Yeah. All right. Um, Grace, hello. Welcome. Good to have you. Full steam ahead. Couldn't agree more, Vissel. We've got some people already here from Facebook, from YouTube, and uh, we'll see about Twitch. Luba's here. Fantastic. Good to have you. Awesome. Nelly is here. Excellent. Very good. Alex Herrera is here. Ricardo Venture. Okay. Hey, Luke, how's it going? Any follow-up on the customer service courses? Yes. Glad you asked. I uh, What great timing to ask this question. So, right now, uh, so so far I've released two, there's a, there's a new set of basically nine courses coming out. I know some of you have already taken the two of the new ones. So, I've launched two. One is how to improve your English, basically the methodology for improving your English. And then the other one is about pronunciation. So it's sort of a next level to the American English pronunciation course that is uh, pretty, pretty popular. Then uh, I'm doing a sequel to the customer service English course, and that's the next one coming out. This one specifically is about emails. I found a very big pain point around writing very clear, concise emails because a lot of the courses out there were very um, silly, not very realistic, like giving you templates that no one would actually ever write, overly formal. Uh, professional English writing, professional English especially for emails and communication in general for English settings professionally is not necessarily formal. There's a level of there's a level of respectfulness that needs to happen, but not necessarily formality. And you have to be very sensitive to that in different situations. So we're doing a very similar format to the customer service course where we look at a case. We look at a scenario for each one. Then we break down the actual email and take out some the insights from that. And you can then use those emails as the sort of templates for your own situations. It's, I'm, I'm really happy with how it's turning out. That one should be coming out either at the end of this month or the very beginning of next month. So mwah, very excited about that. Good to have more people joining. Esther's here. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Again, if you have questions about anything related to your English learning, things you've been struggling with, whether those are broad, general questions like, I don't know how to make a routine, or specific questions, ask away, okay? Grammar questions, writing questions, anything you need to know. And then, of course, we also have some, uh, some useful stuff to share. We're going to be looking at some pronunciation videos, and I'm going to be giving feedback. One thing I found is 
videos may be a good way to give feedback as though it were a student speaking, and then we can all kind of learn from that. I kind of realized that recently when we looked at the um, Squid Game video last time is it's actually a good way to imagine that's the student, then all get something from, oops, from that experience. So I've got my, my can of sparkling water to match my background. Very important. Fazal says, my pronunciation is weak. Well, I don't know if that's a question, Fazal, but um, if you have a question specifically about that, we can talk about it. Let me just quickly, I know I'm pr promoting this a little bit, but I, I won't do it for a while, I promise. But I just want to quickly uh, pop over to uh, the website because I want to show you what how the, how the coupon code thing works. So if you're on the site, right, here's the website. Here are the courses, right, 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 yes, yes, you can see all the courses there, okay. Then um, if you go to all courses, right, all courses, and you scroll down to the bottom, you can see uh, yearly membership. Okay, this is the thing that is on sale right now. So I'll click on that, and then this is the checkout page. It comes with all these courses, but as I mentioned, more courses coming out. So we'll also include those courses when they come out. So it's future future courses as well. And if you put in the code A U T U M N Autumn and click apply then you can see it goes down by a lot. So that's what's going on. That is how it works. So that's in the link in the description. All right, no more, no more, uh, no more of that. Well, not no more, no more right now. <laughs> I've been working in, a call in the call center industry for a couple of years. Your videos are the ones that made me improve my accent and fluency. Thank you, buddy. Very nice, excellent. Good to hear it. Happy about that. Why do future continuous passive, future continuous present, present continuous passive, and past perfect continuous passive do not make sense in the passive voice? They exist for real. <laughs> what kind of only what kind of question is that? Only from an English teacher could we start to parse that. Um, okay. Present, con present perfect continuous. Let me think about that. Yeah. Okay. Present perfect continuous. Uh, past perfect continuous. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Don't make sense in the passive voice. Oh, I see. Oh my goodness. Vissel always with the always with the uh, the very out of left field. Very. Uh, odd questions um yeah well yeah you pointed it out i suppose that's i think that's correct i have to think about that for a second is that correct yeah i think that's right i think so i think so all right um well maybe what we can do is get started with i've got a few topics planned so we can get started with that and then We'll get to questions when those come up. You hear that siren? Ah. Okay, first one. So, when you hear people who don't speak English natively speaking English. There are different ways in which their pronunciation maybe <clears throat> tends to sound, right? Every language has its own natural sounds. These sounds are called phonemes. And some languages have more phonemes, some languages have fewer. I believe English has 44. These are the unique sounds 
in the language, like ah, that's a one, and j, that's one. These are the sounds that make up the language. Some have a lot, some have much less. Now, when you hear someone who's not a native English speaker speaking English, you can learn a lot from noticing the sounds that they make, right? Even if, you know, those are not your pronunciation issues, you can learn a lot from noticing those things, being aware of those things, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a short video. It's a video that I, I it's, it's, a, it's a great video. It's very funny. Uh, uh, it's an old video. I, I remember watching it maybe in 2011 or something. It's a short clip from a Japanese TV show where there's an English lesson and one of the students is called up to speak. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to pick out some of the things that are difficult for this student and we're going to see how we could help this student improve if we wanted to. But then I want you to also pay attention to those sounds so that you can develop your awareness. Can you actually hear what's going on there? Why is it that Japanese English speakers, when they speak English, tend to struggle with certain sounds? And maybe Chinese English speakers might struggle with different sounds. And maybe Russian English speakers might struggle with different sounds, right? Why is this? Well, it's because each language has their own phonemes. But the key thing that I want you to take away is you don't know what those things are until you develop awareness. And that is your ability to notice things, your ability, your ability to sort of hear the difference between this and that. Oh, yeah, I can hear the difference. If you don't have awareness, you can't hear the difference. If you can't hear the difference, you can't ever correct your own pronunciation or improve your own pronunciation. And if you don't know how to improve your own pronunciation, you'll never build up good habits, right? So let's take a look at this at this video. We're going to kind of go through it slowly. It's a good one. It's a classic. Uh, and uh, I, I, you know, I'm not criticizing. I'm not criticizing anything. I think the this <laughs> this girl is so is actually so cute. It's so funny. It's it's brave of her to to speak in front of a class and uh, being recorded, right? That's awesome. I'm just using it as we're using it here as a as a tool to improve our uh, our listening skill and our awareness. Okay, here we go. Shock. Shock. I'll read the subtitles in case you can't see them. Okay, so they're the the teachers at the front. This is like a a TV show where they're learning English. Who's going to talk about her shock or shocking incident? Shock. Ooh, ooh. Ah. Uh, please enjoy sixth generation member Kame's uh, miraculous English conversation. Note that in the subtitles there, they put in quotes miraculous. So that sounds sarcastic, like it's not miraculous. Please enjoy. Sixth generation member. I don't know what that means, though. <laughs> oh, I think 16-year-old. I ate cheese that was in the refrigerator at home, but actually that was for my dog. Okay, so that's what she's going to try to say, and this is her shocking story. She's going to try to say it in English. Oh. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Yes, when I found out later, I was shocked. Okay, so there's cheese in a refrigerator, and then the cheese is for dogs, her dog. Okay, so now she's going to try to say it in English. Here we go. You can do it. Now in English. え、チーズ。チーズ。ボックス。くる。オッケー。レッツ、レッツ
So what would be the difference between the Z sound in cheese and what she said, cheese? Notice anything? I hear two syllables, teta, whereas I would pronounce this with one syllable, cheese, cheese, cheese. Also notice the different Z sound. That S makes a Z sound, so instead of it being Z, that's a little bit too hard. The English Z sound tends to be much softer, and so it's Z. So the English Z sound is Z. You should be able to carry it on for a long time. Cheese, one syllable. Box. Okay, again. She's making a two, a one-syllable word, two syllables. Box. Box. The one, one reason I love to imitate different accents is because it's a great way to practice your awareness to imitate different accents. Cheese, box, box, box. So it's a really hard K sound and it's being two syllables. Well, if we took off the U uh at the end, then box, box. Okay, that, that would be more like the British English pronunciation. That would be okay. We've taken out the U uh sound. How would Americans say it? I would say more of an ah uh sound instead of o. Oh. Ah, box, box, cheese box, cheese box. Kuru. Ah, again, two syllables, kuru. And instead of an L here, it's a ru, ru, ru. So that's kind of a roll of the tongue, re, 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 where you roll your tongue outward, right? Ru, ru, ru. You're actually touching your tongue to the roof of your mouth for a very brief moment. So it's two syllables, and it's this sort of rolling R sound that replaces the L sound. Uh, so there, you would just say, cool, cool. And that still touches the tongue to the top of the roof of your mouth, but you don't release it. It stays there, cool, cool. If you use R, if you want to use R, your tongue never touches the roof of your mouth. Core, for example, C-O-R-E, okay. So he's maybe having a difficult time understanding her because this two-syllable thing, changing one-syllable words to two-syllable words, makes it hard to kind of catch the meaning. Box, what is box? Oh, box. Oh, okay. He says, you want to say refrigerator, right? And she says, yes, refrigerator. It's kind of hard. I'll tell you how to say refrigerator. Refrigerator. So he says refrigerator, refrigerator. But actually, I feel that most, I'm assuming he's American or Canadian based on the way he speaks. Uh, actually, I think most people would say refrigerator refrigerator. So the difference would be we don't hit the T so hard. Not refrigerator, but refrigerator. Refrigerator. So you hear that? There's a light D sound, der, 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 which is actually, ironically, the same as that kuru. Du, that du is the same as the der that we use to replace the T sound in a lot of words in English. Refrigerator. Now I'm correcting him. <laughs> no, he's not wrong. It's correct. It's just I think most people wouldn't say it like that. But he's not actually teaching them how to make the sound, right? He's not actually teaching them the pronunciation. He's just saying it. So you have to break it down a little bit. There's the re and then the fri that is very hard because the R is right beside the F. Fri and then jur, jur. That's like a J sound. And then a long sound and then der, 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 der. Oh, okay. One more time. Refrigerator. Hmm? Refrigerator. 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 Very. Uh -huh. Excuse me? Refresh. <laughs> Refresh. Oh, they misunderstood. Refrigerator. Refrigerator. Very good. Refrigerator. Okay. okay, that's better. So, there, if you listen carefully, she's got the syllables right, right? Listen carefully. Refrigerator. Refrigerator. Very good. So she's got the syllables. Refrigerate. 
character. So that was the first issue: is adding syllables to the word, right? For example, box. But now, and also furi, furi, that two syllables, adding that. She's got it pretty much now, but she's still doing the uri sound at the beginning. So what would we want to do to fix that r sound? We would say, don't touch your tongue to the top of your mouth. If you want to say the r sound correctly, correctly, your tongue, the tip of your tongue, cannot touch the top of the roof of your mouth. If you feel it touch, it's wrong. So it's just sitting there in the middle, kind of curled back, not touching anything. Re, re, instead of uri, which is flicking outward and touching, so it shouldn't touch. Refrigerator. Yeah. In. Mm-hmm. Cheese. Refrigerator in cheese. <laughs> oh my God. Cheese in the He says it's the other way. Cheese in refrigerator. <laughs> Yeah, so she just mixed up the order there. Uh, she mixed up the word in. Preposition in would mean one. The first thing you say, if you have in after it, is the thing that's usually smaller, right? And is contained by the second thing you say. Cheese in refrigerator. Ah. Cheese in cheese in cheese in refrigerator. <laughs> She's so cute. <laughs> Can we have you say refrigerator one more time? As students are asking one more. <laughs> hey, don't laugh at her. That's so nice. <laughs> refrigerator. One more. Refrigerator. 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 Mm. Refrigerator. Refrigerator. Mm -hmm. well, another thing there is at the end. That's a tough one too. If there's a sound at the end, she's saying a da at the end. It's a da da da. That da sound is just the open a at the end. If there's an r at the end, you have to still remember to curl the tongue up. Er, refrigerator. If you need to remember it, just do it very long, and then you can remind yourself to do it. Refrigerator. So you can make the R's really, really long, as a way to help yourself remember. Yeah. <laughs> So again, that's the uh, switching the in of the preposition. Hand in cheese, cheese in hand, cheese in my hand. In cheese. Oh my God. Here's a cheese in your hand. Cheese in hand. Okay. Cheese in hand. Cheese in hand. Okay. Eat. I. I. Eat. 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 Cheese. Cheese. In. In. Refrigerator. Refrigerator. So, that's not correct. I eat cheese in refrigerator. I eat the cheese in my refrigerator. He's giving her incorrect English. Come on, man. Come on, teacher man. I ate the cheese in my refrigerator, or I eat the cheese in the refrigerator would be good. You gotta have. Gotta use those. Yes. But. Hmm. Mother. Hmm. Talk. Oh. Ah. So there, uh, th. If you listen carefully to the uh, that sound. Mother. So there's again the r thing at the end. We want to make sure to curl the tongue up at the end of r. Mother. But notice also the th sound is becoming kind of a z sound. Ma za za. So the z has replaced the voiced th sound. Th generally has two pronunciations. Actually, it has three. But the most common are the two pronunciations. One's voiced and one's unvoiced. And the voiced one is like, where you have your tongue out like that. 
And the other one is unvoiced, where you don't use your voice because it's unvoiced. So when you have a word like mother, you've got to flick your tongue out and get used to the feeling of the, 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 like that. And the reason for that is because if you replace it with a Z, it can cause misunderstandings, right? I think there's a difference between accent, right? Everyone has their own slightly different way of speaking and not using pronunciation that's clear enough so that people understand. So someone might understand, misunderstand, maza, because there's a Z there. And they might think of Mazda, they might not understand that, right? So that would be something to correct. Talk. Oh. Said. Dog food. Dog cheese. Dog cheese. My. Haha, shabiru. Dog cheese. Dog cheese. My. My shock. I see. I see. Okay. I think she wanted to say there, uh, mother told me the cheese was for the dog. And I was shocked. But I mean, very brave to try to speak. She, her English level is obviously quite low. And that she would stand up and try to put a sentence together is brave and, and admirable. To not be afraid, to just try, to just do it. No matter if you're wrong or people laugh. Like he was laughing at her, right? He was laughing at her. But she didn't mind. She took it in good humor. If you're always cautious and careful and worried about people laughing, then it's going to be hard to gain confidence and make progress. So it's the right attitude, definitely, to improve her pronunciation. Just a few things to work on there, especially the R sound in words and at the ends of words, and making one-syllable words, two-syllable words, and also, of course, the, the Z, the TH, and Z flipping thing. Oh, and, and the and the prepositions, uh, the order of the order of the things when you use a preposition like cheese in hand or hand in cheese, right? But everyone has their own little things to work on, myself included, right? I, I consider myself to be an English learner and I'm always trying to improve how I communicate and how I speak. And so I think it's important to then just develop the ability to notice things. If you can develop that, that's a superpower. You can hear things that you didn't hear before. If you can do that and then turn it into self-awareness so that you can start noticing yourself and things you need to improve, be honest with yourself, then you're going to actually start making progress, okay? So hopefully you found this interesting and useful. If you haven't already done so, guys, don't forget to hit the like button. Don't forget to also subscribe and check out my full courses in the links in the description. All right. Good. Interesting one. Paulo is watching from from uh, Brazil. S oh, Lemuria? SP. What does SP stand for? Nelly says, I like your accent. Thank you, Nelly. I appreciate that. Saori says, hi, I'm Japanese. Speaking English is very difficult for us. Yes, that's right. Um, but not impossible. One, one thing I heard, I mean, I think it's interesting. It, it's difficult f if you, unless you work on it in the right way, right? So, I was watching on TikTok. There's uh, a, it's a lady on TikTok who sometimes does, Jap she's Japanese. Sometimes she does English. She's just talking usually about her, her art or something. And sometimes she's speaking in Japanese and sometimes English. And I think she, she lives in America, right? But she English is not her native language. But she speaks English very, very well. She used, I mean, it's, she sounds like a native English speaker. You wouldn't even know. So it's possible for everybody. So the, the mistake would be to say, oh, I can't because, because English is hard for Japanese people. Now, I mean, 
maybe some pronunciation things tend to be more difficult to master, but that doesn't mean you can't, right? So you have to really have the right attitude to say, I can, I can learn anything. And if you have that attitude, you probably can actually. More likely to succeed, I think. EJ says, yes, very similar to in to Korean English. Interesting. You mean the uh, the the consonant the consonant thing? You know, I found a video of, of French speakers too, um, and maybe I'll just play that one quickly. Well, just we're not going to actually do the breakdown of this one, but just to just to sort of highlight this idea of awareness and that every place has their own unique sort of accent and style. So let's let's just check this out quickly. Here we have some French speakers. Um, uh, really. Not bilingual, but I tried to do my best. My accent is very, very bad. <laughs> no. Um, no, it's difficult. Hi, guys. So there, that's a different thing, right? There, uh, he says difficult, right? So there's a different sound there. Uh, maybe Americans or uh, most most English speakers would maybe make that sound a, a shorter sound, diff, f, 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 called a schwa sound. It's called a schwa, S-C-H-W-A. That is an unstressed vowel. And what makes difficult sound native as opposed to not? Well, it might be small things like that, right? Like um, the stress on a vowel. It just takes a lot of practice. How are you? Oh, dude, dude. Oh, he's, they're trying to do American accents. <laughs> I come from uh, America. Yeah, you know what I mean? You know what oh I mean? Oh my God, it's like amazing, you know? It's yeah, that's pretty good. Oh my God, it's amazing, you know? Mix between British and American accent. Pretty good. Uh, you should... Uh... All right, well, I mean, I don't want to watch the whole video. I just wanted to kind of share, uh, share slightly different pronunciation. Uh, I mean... I've, I've, I'm fascinated by different ways of speaking English. I'm very interested in different ways to speak, different pronunciations, and so on. Hello, Karina. Karina is here on YouTube. Ooh, amazing. Uh, Raua, is that how you say your name? Hello, greetings. Let me catch up on a few things here. Let's see if I missed any questions. Right, so we got a question from Ashraf here. Ashraf says, what does simultaneously mean? So it's a good question from Ashraf. It simply means at the same time, right? But you can use it in different ways. How do you actually use it? There's a difference between knowing a word, knowing what it means, and then knowing how to use it, and even more importantly, how most people use it so that you can sound natural when you do use it, right? So we tend to have two different forms of this. Simultaneously is an adverb. Simultaneously is an adjective. Um, simulta did I say that? Simultaneous is the adjective. Simultaneously is the adverb. Right. So if you say that two things are simultaneous, then you're describing them as though they have that trait or characteristic. Right. We would say the events are simultaneous. The events are simultaneous. Okay, so that's using them as an adjective. What are they? They're simultaneous. Okay, they're describing the events. But actually, that's not as common, probably not nearly as common as the word simultaneously, used as an adverb. Now, why? Well, think about it. Usually, when we're talking about things happening at the same time, we're talking about actions. And so, actions are described by adverbs, right? So when would we use simultaneously? So we could say I was drinking a cup of coffee, watching a movie, petting my cat, and reading a book simultaneously. I was simultaneously drinking a cup of coffee, petting my cat, watching a movie, and reading a book. So actually, you can move it around. It doesn't have to be locked in one place when you use it. I'm doing those things at the same time. 
Is there any difference in saying at the same time and simultaneously? Well, at the same time has its own separate meanings. We often use it to say things like at the same time, maybe. So that's sort of saying, but that's a, a slightly different usage of at the same time. So they don't always mean the same time. But at the same time, they usually do. <laughs> that makes sense. So use simultaneously when you want to express something fairly fairly quickly. You want to just say yeah, they're, they're at the same time, they're happening at the same time, and maybe you're not trying to focus on that fact or not trying too much to focus on that fact. It's very flexible. You can use it in a lot of different ways. And as I said, you can move it around. I feel that simultaneously has a slightly more formal sound to it compared to at the same time, right? So we, for example, we left home simultaneously. We left home at the same time. These two actions happen at the same time. I think there, because it's just kind of a casual action, it's not... Uh, it's, it's not important that it happen exactly at the same time and it's more general. It feels more relaxed to me. I would use at the same time there instead of simultaneously. Whereas if I want to emphasize the sameness a little bit more, then I might use simultaneously. For example, they, complete, they completed the exam simultaneously, five seconds before the, uh, the buzzer went off. Okay. Maybe I would say simultaneously there because I really want to emphasize the fact that it's exactly at the same time. There's a bit more focus on the exactness when we use simultaneously. The feeling is that way. And also, I feel it's a bit more formal sounding. So hopefully that answers your question. That's a good one. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe and also check out my full courses in the links in the description. Okay. Right. I just want to see if I missed any questions from anybody. You think that there is a big difference between the dialects in America, Rua from Algeria. Yes, definitely. Yeah, that's a good question, Rua. Rua says, do you think that there's a big difference between the dialects in America? So that's a, that's a good one because I think... You might hear them, but not notice them. How does it sound living in you know, the United States, different ways of speaking? And it's just like anywhere, I think. different. Every country, ha well, some countries have multiple languages. But let's say a region with a language may have smaller regions with variations. Right? Like there's in, in the UK, there are different ways to speak English, right? There are different styles of English. Same goes for China. There are many different dialects in China. Well, of course, in the United States, there are many different ways to speak. And the interesting thing is how I think those reflect the lifestyle in those areas. For example, when I hear typical surfer dude California English, my feeling is, oh, this is a more real, a slightly more relaxed place where uh, having fun and and uh, relaxing is more of a priority than getting stuff done. And then when I hear East Coast, especially New York, I feel that sort of I'm in a hurry. I need to get somewhere quickly. I need to get stuff done. <laughs> I'm hustling. I'm going from place to place. I can kind of feel that when I hear those accents. And in the, the South, the Southern accent, there's just a slightly more laid back feeling. My experience of going to the South is people tend to be a little more laid back. I mean, obviously, that's a huge generalization. But I think 
in some ways the, the, the accent, the dialect reflects the general culture of the of the region, right? So New York, the t sort of stereotypical New Yorker talks like this. They they gotta go somewhere, they gotta get on the they gotta get on the subway, they gotta go to the they gotta go to the the, the two line, they gotta get downtown by six o'clock, they gotta get a coffee, they gotta have lunch. Everything's kind of a rush, right? Uh, and then when you go out west, it's, hey, man, this is surfer dude. The classic surfer dude. There's actually a guy on, on TikTok who does, we'll have to look at that sometime, but he he talks like this and everything he says kind of has a slightly upward inflection when he talks and it just feels a little bit more like, whoa, everything's fine and that's cool and yeah. And it's less exact, less precise, and less hurried. It's not a, not a great impression. Then down south, which feels more laid back, and people tend to have a bit of a what's called a southern drawl when they when they speak down down in maybe Georgia or or anywhere down south. A lot of people have this kind of way of speaking. It's different from place to place, but. Some t I think I just did a Texas there first. I'm so I get confused between my southern accent and my Texas accent. I get it all mixed up. It's not very good. But that's the kind of flavor of it, right? So I think, again, this highlights the importance of awareness. Is there one way to speak English? Absolutely not. There are many different ways. Should I tell you who's what's right and what's wrong? Absolutely not. 100%. You decide what you like more and how you want to adjust your pronunciation. I would recommend making sure people can understand you. But as much as possible, expose yourself to different ways of speaking the language. Whatever you're happening, whatever you happen to be learning, whether it's English or something else, the broader your comfort zone, what you're used to hearing, the more you can sort of pick what to focus on next, better. So I would encourage you to listen for everything. Pay attention to the differences between different accents. It's a, it's a good question from Raua. I hope I'm saying that correctly. If you guys haven't done so, don't forget to hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe and also check out my full courses in the links in the description. We did actually watch a video last time where they were exploring different dialects specifically in terms of words, right? Um, I don't know if I still have that one, but they have different different uh, words in different regions as well. It's not just the pronunciation. It's actually the words. Like in New York, a lot of people say schlep, to schlep things around, to move them around. One says, I don't know why it is so complicated for me to understand the Joe Rogan podcast. Yeah, that's a good, that's maybe because, I mean, often they're just talking about things that you might not have the references for. So it's not about the words necessarily or the pronunciation or the speed. It's about just not having enough references to know the topic of what they're talking about because it's maybe late, related to something in specifically in American culture that you're maybe not aware of. So it's often not just the language, it's often the references as well. Okay, let me actually, I wanna explore something here. Give me a second. Keep the questions coming, though. More than welcome. <laughs> so, It's sometimes difficult to try to get immersion when you're learning English, right? If you don't live in 
the United States or Canada or Australia, it's, it's hard to, can be hard to get immersion. Well, it can seem that way, but actually not necessarily. If you really want to, you can have English immersion every day, no matter where you are, as long as you have the internet. And you may have seen some of my other videos where we talk about how to get that. Well, I want to explore one called Quora, which you've probably heard of, as a great way to not only get useful content, but also practice what you're learning to actually use your English. We all know that, yeah, it's a good idea to sit down and practice maybe writing a short essay or something like that or blog post, but can you actually force yourself to do it? Well, often it's difficult, but what if you had a reason because you were helping someone understand something better? That might be an interesting way to put what you're learning into practice and improve and help people and maybe gain some followers as well. So it's, it's in some ways a great way to feed multiple birds with one scone. We're going to be looking at Quora and how we can use Quora as a way to improve English, as a way to have English immersion. It actually covers a lot of different areas at the same time. So let's explore this. I'm, I'm exploring this as, a, as I would if I were going to learn English now. How would I approach it? How would I do it if I wanted to immerse myself in the language? Okay, so I'm going to hop over here to I'm going to hop over here to Quora. This is uh, the main page. When, when you first sign up, you are asked to choose some interests. You can add to those over time, but you're asked to sort of pick some things that you're interested in following. But you can always just search a topic. So what are you interested in? Are you interested in anime? Are you interested in construction? Are you interested in English-specific content or sports or whatever it may be? So. I've, I've uh, put in construction here, and I could search different types. There's uh, daily construction tips. These are specific spaces, but there's also just a general search. And you can follow topics, like I could follow the topic construction. It has 695,000 followers. Okay, so now I'm following that. And you get some you get some posts about the topic and you can read these things. What are most of these posts? They're questions. So people ask questions like, what is the role of mechanical engineer in construction in construction site of any building? And you can see that someone has answered that question. So you might read their answer and you might learn more about that. And I'm just giving construction as an example. We could search, you could search anything, right? Maybe it's a uh, Skyrim or uh, I don't know, whatever you're interested in, just search it. But then the cool thing is, if that's something that you're interested in, if that's something that you know something about, then you can make it more interactive. Part of the immersion that you get when you go to a native English speaking country is that you're not just getting things one way. You're not just hearing things. You're not just surrounded by things. You're not just reading things. You're also chatting with people, text messaging, sending emails. You might have a job there, right? Sending emails every day. You're talking with people when you buy stuff, when you walk around, when you ask for directions, you're interacting. So that's a very important part, input and output, right? So what if, for example, we searched English language, okay? Now, I would choose this one maybe because I, I know something about it. Here I am. So English language, a 4.8 eight million followers. I'm going to follow that topic. And I can read these different questions and answers. So uh, let's see. Can Jackie Chan speak English fluently? Okay. <laughs> Someone has answered that one. And the, the answers get upvotes. So this is another way for you to interact with people. You might write an answer or a response to someone else's answer and then interact with people and people might vote up your comments or down and you can get a little feedback on what you do. I've noticed recently there are, there are more, more ads than usual. So like this one um, seems to be an ad for something, a few more ads than usual, but it's not, it's not that bad. Uh, I am who I am, what does that mean? 
Okay, so someone has answered that one. And you can follow these people as well. So you can connect with people, which is cool. Now what I want to do is go to here, which is answer. So if I click on answer, you see questions that need answers, questions that you might answer. And this is where it gets very interesting. So you might pick something, and again, this is just the language category, based on what you know, based on your area of expertise, based on your interest, right? So here's some questions. <laughs> what does 1.5K followers mean? That's actually a good question. You can see 23 people have already answered it. I'm not going to answer that one because I'm assuming someone has got it right. I could check the answers if I want to or comment on people's answers. Let's see if I can find an interesting one here. Uh, no answer. See, some of these say no answer yet. Some of them say six answers. Let's see. Uh, let's see if I can find one. Which is correct? He must go or goes to school. Ah, okay. So then I might decide, oh, this one is the one I can answer. He must go or goes to school. And then I might just click answer right away. Now notice here, I have my Grammarly plugin ex uh, installed. If you're using, for example, Google, uh, whatever browser you're using, you can install an add-on or a plugin for Grammarly. That is so that anything you write will at least help you have a, a spell check and a grammar checker. I use it for everything. It really helps me a lot. I strongly recommend you use it as well. It's of course free so then I can say maybe he must go is correct because and then I could go into my explanation and this is where you can get creative. I happen to know the answer to this and why it's this way and I think I can explain it clearly but maybe you have a different answer for something that you know something about. This is where it gets really interesting because you're able to put your skills into practice not only sending it into the void by just writing it down for yourself, which is kind of just for you, but doing it so that other people can benefit from what you know or what you think. And then getting feedback based on what you wrote is upvotes, right? That's good. Also, there's the added pressure of knowing there's an audience. This isn't just for me. This is for other people, they're reading it, and that makes me want to be extra careful to make sure that my sentences are correct. I'm using the right words. I'm using words naturally. And that's going to force you to do a little research to make sure that, hey, did, should this be past tense or present tense? That kind of thing. That little bit of pressure is actually a really, really, really good thing. And that's the same thing you get when you go to a, a native English speaking country and you have immersion pressure. Someone's looking at me. Someone's asking me a question. Someone's saying, what do you want? I need to answer them. So, right. So it's a good thing to have someone watching what you do because it's going to force you a little bit to push yourself to do more than you would do if it was just you by yourself, right? So that's why I recommend looking at Grammarly. You can do this for other communities too. Reddit is a pretty good one. You could do it under YouTube comments, I guess, or Facebook, but Facebook communities are good. Facebook groups for sure. Uh, Reddit is really good, I think, for that sort of thing too. If you can find a good community that you like, they're called subreddits. Uh, YouTube comments, I don't know, not so much. Usually it's just a lot of, uh, uh, I don't know, people yelling at each other, I feel like. <laughs> that tends to be what it is. Anyway, let me know if you find this useful or if you have any questions about this or what kind of things you write about if you decide to use Quora. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. That helps a lot. And of course, check out my courses in the links in the description. All right. Yep. Uh. I don't know why it's so complicated. Da, da, da. Hello, says Venus. Hey, JS has a question. How to learn English if someone in your family member is always making fun of your spoken English and brings you down? 
I've never used Quora to write down my opinions or answers. Sounds like a good way to practice writing. For sure, it's a good way to practice. 100%. 100%. All right. JS0000 zero, 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 says, how to learn English if someone in your family is always making fun of your spoken English and brings you down? That's a really tough one, right? If you have someone around you who's a negative influence. Now, you can try to use it by having that sort of prove them wrong thing, right? I remember there's... Uh, an example of someone who is trying to lose a lot of weight and he asked his friend to text him every day saying something like, good morning, fatty. Uh, uh, what are you going to eat today, fatso? That sort of thing as a way to kind of get him upset uh, to then motivate him to <laughs> prove him wrong and say, ah, I'm going to show you. I'm going to I'm going to lose a bunch of weight and work out and do all the things I need to do to finally not be that thing that you're calling me, right? And he asked his friend to do that. That was a, an act of friendship, and it worked for him. So if there were a way for you to somehow judo your this person's negativity into a, ha-ha, I'll show you sort of way of acting, you can build a plan and you can actually improve and speak really well and then well, they're very impressed and shocked. That's not always possible because this person is just really, really negative, right? So what do you do in that situation? Because confidence when it comes to speaking English is way more important than most people think. Most people think that it's all about the skill. It's all about the knowledge. Oh, you know this many words? Oh, you, you learned this grammar? Great, that must mean that your English is really good when you speak. No. English is much more, speaking a language in general, is much more closely connected to things like sports, uh, any sort of skill that you have. You do it well because you get good at it, but getting good at it is part of feeling confident when you're doing it, feeling relaxed. And if you always have someone there saying, you're not good, you're bad, you're terrible, you'll never get good at this, it's hard to build that confidence. Confidence is just so important. So in this case, and this is more personal advice than English advice. In this case, you need to change this dynamic. You need to change this situation. This person is preventing you from growing. So I would try to avoid making it a fight, making it a confrontation, right? And instead, try to get this person to see it from your point of view. You might choose something that they do that you don't criticize them about and say, how would you feel if every time you, maybe they, you live with this person, maybe they cook, for example. If every time you made a meal for the family, I said, this is disgusting. This is awful. Well, I can't believe you added this much salt. <laughs> you know, what, how, you ask them that. How would you feel if I said this to you? And then they'll think, huh, yeah, how would I feel? Well, I suppose I wouldn't feel good about that. And maybe it's something else, right? Then you've already got them halfway there. Now they see it. They realize that they're doing that to you. Then you say, this is how I feel when you criticize my English. They might not even realize that they're doing it. Maybe they think it's funny. Maybe they think it's a joke. And I think it's always important to never get upset because that starts a confrontation. Very honest, very open, very calm. Yeah, well, oh, I guess I wouldn't feel good. Well, that's, that's how I feel when you criticize my English. Really, I didn't know you felt that way. Well, I would appreciate it if you could encourage me instead of trying to discourage me because improving my English is very important to me. I really want to improve my English and I just feel a little insecure and a little self-conscious about it. I could use positive reinforcement. Very likely, I don't know this person, but much more likely they're going to do that because now they see it. 
Most of the time, people criticize or are mean, mean, I put in quotes, because they just don't know. They're not aware of how you feel, right? And they haven't seen it in the right context. But if you frame it in that kind of way and you make them see it as though they were in your shoes, if you kind of push them into your shoes, they're going to be more likely to, in the future, be more supportive and let them know how they can be supportive. Doesn't mean complimenting you every time you speak English. Maybe it just means speaking better English in the home if that person speaks better English than you. Ah, you're better than me. Maybe we could practice English together. I could use the practice. There are a lot of different ways to do it. But this kind of idea comes from a great book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's a great book about how to communicate so that other people feel every interaction is a win, right? You're getting them to do something. You're kind of influencing them, but they feel respected and you are respectful, but that also gets you what you want, right? So it's a great book. I strongly recommend it. Good question from JS. I mean, that's a bigger question than just English, of course. If you guys haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe and also check out my full courses in the links in the description. Also, I mentioned before, but the yearly membership, if you want to get that, is at 50% off, 50% discount on the yearly membership. Um, for a limited time, it's the Black Friday uh, sale. If you go to the link in the description and you put in the code AUTUMN, you'll get a 50% discount. Can you say foods in English or just food? It should be usually it's food. Usually it's food. Sometimes foods is correct, but most of the time it's food. Another question, please. Is learning languages difficult? I'm now learning German and my mother tongue is Arabic, but I found problems that German is very difficult and complicated. Of course, I think some people are better at it than others. You know, some people have a sort of natural gift for things, right? So some people pick up languages very quickly and some people struggle with it. It's different for everybody, right? Now, everyone can learn, but the the speed of learning is tends to be different for everybody because people have people are different. People have natural tendencies, natural gifts. Uh, the reason the reason that someone might be naturally more athletic has something to do with their genetics. Not all, of course, but partly your natural tendencies. So yeah, yeah learning languages is hard. Uh, not all languages are the same. So different languages might be easier than others. Uh, so for example, you might be easier for you to learn a language more similar to Arabic than German is. Uh, but, uh, and, and of course, you know, languages uh, uh, depend on how hard you work. So it's also, you know, how much time you have to spend. A lot of different variables. The best thing to do is not focus on how good you are or how bad you are, but just keep working at it and try to find ways to enjoy doing it. Because if you enjoy doing it, it will be really easy to keep going. And if you don't enjoy doing it and it's, ugh, I hate this, it's going to be very easy to give up. JS says, yeah, there's no point in changing others or just reacting emotionally because at the end of the day, we have no control of how others treat us, but we can control how we react to the situation. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Uh, but I really find a, it's very useful to try to change people's context, get them to see things from your point of view. And that can often be done with a sort of how would you feel if question. German and English are relative languages. Yes, that's correct. German and English are connected. They're, they're related. They are related. How can I move to intermediate from intermediate to upper advanced speaking? Uh, that's a long answer. Nothing I can say in a short video. For that, for that, <laughs> I would recommend a course. The courses that I make are for when you get serious, right? I make courses that some of them are long, like seven, eight hours, nine hours, 15 hours. It's for when people are ready to move off of 
YouTube, because YouTube is good, but it's sort of little here, little there, Facebook, you know, these sort of live streams. Yeah, you get stuff. But if you want like hardcore, serious, you're ready to learn and go through a long program, it, my answer is take uh, take Master Native English course. Uh, take that course. <laughs> that would be that's my advice. Um, this one, I'll quickly show you. This one, this would be my recommendation. Yep, 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 yep. That's the one. And you can get access to that one and all the others with the membership, which is half off. Amazing. I did have one more of those videos to share. I don't want to watch the whole thing, but um, is it better to learn words from their translation in your native language or learn the meaning of the word? Oh, easy answer. Amine is here. Hello. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry for sniffling. I apologize. Dora the Explorer says, is it better to learn words from their translation in your native language or just learn the meaning of the word? And the answer is 100% to learn the meaning of the word. Why is that? So if you take a word and translate it to another language, what you're translating is the, let's say, main sense or meaning of that word. What you're not translating may be all the other meanings that that word may have, and even more importantly, all of the connotation associated with that language. Interesting. So maybe we could maybe we could do an example, right? So there's in, in Chinese so English English the word play translates into Chinese. And it's used in a lot of the same ways. Where we would say to play video games. Right. Okay. So in English, uh, play video games. Chinese, Mario C. So that's the same. It's basically the same. But in English, there are some ways we use that word that we wouldn't maybe use them in another language like Chinese. So, for example, we would say, hit the play button. So that's using play either as an adjective or sometimes hit play, which would be using it kind of as a noun. That's a thing. Well, it's not really used that way in Chinese. Okay, well, that's a difference. Then in Chinese, that one, you would go out to play with your friends. That's how it's said in Chinese. That would be translating it back from Chinese to English. It would translate back to, I went out to play with my friends. But we would never say that in English. You would never say, I'm going out to play with my friends as an adult. So for adults, you never go out to play. But kids might go out to play. So kids play, but adults don't play. So there is a cultural difference that's not specifically the meaning of the word in the dictionary, but is the connotation of the word and how it tends to be used. And that stuff is very difficult to translate over. This is the simple reason why you never see a Google Translate that's perfect. It never quite looks right, right? No matter which language it is, it just it doesn't quite look right. Because each word, sometimes they mean the same thing, and sometimes they mean other things because they have different meanings, right? So sometimes play means do. Sometimes play means go. Sometimes play means, uh, uh, I don't know, experiment, right? So it can have different senses. It can has, have different meanings depending on the situation. And beyond that, different 
feelings and connotations beyond that. So what do you do? Ah, sounds so difficult. How can I ever translate? No. What you do is forget that you even know another language. When you speak English, say to yourself, I speak English. I'm an English speaker. Uh, English speakers, when they learned English the first time, they, they weren't translating from another language, from, from baby language to English. They were just learning English. They were surrounded by it. And over time, they gradually picked up those connotations, those different meanings, naturally from their environment. So if you want to really know English and use it naturally, there's only one option. You have to learn it in English. You have to learn it by using it. You have to learn it by looking at the different uses and trying to understand how people actually use it in daily life. Only then can you start to use it actually naturally. You'll never get there if you're if you're only translating. It just won't happen. And you'll never build that English brain. It's a good question from Dora the Explorer. Um, just keep in mind, you know, stop translating. I guess that's what I'm saying. If you can understand me now, you shouldn't be translating unless you need to know something quickly. I need to know the general translation of this word. That, that's fine. But I mean for learning purposes especially. If you guys haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe and also check out my full courses in the links in the description. Yep, 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 yep. Just speak to myself as though I'm a crazy person. You may, you may th say that as a joke, JS0000, but that's actually something people do. And I've known several students who have done that to great success. There was one girl who was preparing for the IELTS examination and she used to talk to herself every day constantly in English just sitting around talking to herself. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, maybe traveling abroad next year but she would just sit there and talk to herself all the time and her English got really good. It was amazing to see. Now not everyone wants to do that but it's not a joke. That's actually one strategy people use and I think it's actually a pretty good one, if you don't mind what people think. Although you can also just sort of do it to yourself. You know, you can do that too. How can I practice speaking English if I have no one else to talk to? You should check out my video about uh, doing meetups. There are online events on meetup.com. You can join online. Uh, they're happening all around the world in English. They're free, and you can practice speaking every day if you want to using that way. So, yeah, yes, 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 100%. Yep. I want to look at another video just because we were looking at Japanese English earlier. I want to look at one more um, just because we were looking at it. So you may have seen my video before uh, about using voice dictation as a way to practice. And there are different apps for it. You can use, for example, otter. I believe it's otter.ai. It's called otter. Voice transcription. It turns your voice into text. And that's a good way to see if you're able to make the sounds correctly, right? Now, this is actually an idea that originally I got from watching kind of an old video of people on the street practicing or using, trying to uh, speak English to Siri. This is in the earlier days of Siri, uh, uh, Japanese English speakers. They would challenge people to say a word and to see if the if, if Siri could recognize what they were saying. Now, at that time, I think Siri was probably not as good as, as now, right? Voice assistants are really, really good. But it's a good way to see how accurate your speech is. Maybe not to improve your, your pronunciation that much, but to just make sure that you're understood to make sure that other people will be able to understand you. Let's just take a look at, we're not going to watch the whole video, but let's just take a look 
at one of these videos where people try to, in Japan, people try to speak English to Siri and see how well Siri can understand. The twist is that one of these, it's a, a group of girls, one of these girls is a native English speaker. So she speaks English really well and will be able to hear the difference between how she says it and how the others are trying to say it. Okay, so here we go. Voice recognition game. I'll read the subtitles. Let's reveal the first word. Okay, the word is G-I-R-L, girl. Okay, so we have the one on the left. She's the one who's actually got really good English. And then these other girls, um, they, they struggle. We're not going to watch this whole thing here. If you don't sound like a native speaker, the phone will not recognize you. Okay. Okay. What do you hear there? Gao. I hear G-O-W. Gao. Why? There needs to be more of an R there. Right? We have to have a R. The tongue needs to roll up. And then there has to be an L at the end. And your tongue should stay in the L position at the end. Girl. 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 God. God. I thought she said God. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, next up. Dozo. Dozo. God. Oh, also God. So there, God. So she's trying to say the R there, but it's like, it's like, um, well, and that's the, that's the Japanese sound for L is a rolling sound. So that's hard to do, right? So Garu, it's also adding another syllable. And so that's going to be hard. It does sound like God instead of girl. <laughs> it means native speakers will hear you like that. That that's, yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, I think actually voice recognition software like Otter might be even better than humans at understanding in some cases. But um, it is a good way, a good way to practice anyway. <laughs> Next up. Gar. Ah, so there it, it, it thinks that she's saying call. She says call. So she's got an L sound. So she's got the L. Oh, she's got her tongue in the L position. But there it sounds like there's no R, right? So instead of er, it's an er sound. She's, she's saying gall, 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 which sounds a lot like call, call, gall, call. Oh, also God. Uh-oh. Girl. Perfect, right? I think she's a native English speaker who maybe lives in... Japan, I'm assuming. She's clearly a pretty much native. Hey! Native! I think they're going to do another one. She's being very modest, though. This is your tongue. They're, oh, they're actually teaching it. Roll it back and pronounce girl like this. Ah, so they're teaching how to do it. That's right. You roll your tongue backwards when you say the R sound to make it sound correct. And then you have your tongue in the O position. That guy, the, that guy's got it good. That guy's pronounced it girl. It's the R sound is the key. Uh-oh. <laughs> I love that pronunciation. Rizumu. <laughs> Rhythm. So how do we say that? R curled upward, er, and then I, short I sound, I, and then the difficult part there is also the them, rhythm, rhythm, rhythm. So it's a two-syllable word, rhythm, them, them, not them, them, them. So you go directly from the TH sound to the M sound. Okay. Rhythm. <laughs> so she's saying D. There's a D, clear, clear D sound there. D zumu. She's saying D zumu. So she's also not only saying D, D, D zum. 
she's also saying z, z sound instead of the th sound dizumu and then also she's adding a mu at the end dizumu mu mu she's adding a syllable <laughs> pizza hut <laughs> pizza hut <laughs> what 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 wait 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 how wait wait, wait 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 i have to hear that does that sound like pizza hut at all That doesn't sound like Pizza Hut. <laughs> All right. Okay, so there she's not doing the extra syllable. So, it is um, it is um. But there she still got that rolling R thing that sounds like a D. Remember, you got to curl it back. And then she's doing the zoom with the Z instead, but there's it's a little better. Why it starts talking so much? It's getting angry. <laughs> this show is great. Oh, this is a good show. She did the same thing. Rizumu. Rizumu. Maybe the D sound is a little softer there, but it's pretty much the D. She's making a D sound. Lego man. <laughs> Lego man. What? Okay. Let's see how Rina does it. Rhythm. Ooh. Rhythm. She's perfect. Native. They have to have her in there for comparison, right? I'm said she said I'm so happy. I, I she knew she was going to be good. She cuz she's a native native speaker, I guess. Sounded differently. Let's see if they teach this one. Nice. So, I would recommend this method not as the number one best way to improve your uh, pronunciation pronunciation doing a uh, uh, machine sort of practice using uh, using something like otter or if you want to use a google assistant or something like that there are many many different ones but what you can do is just see how well you can be understood if it is like otter is not understanding what you're saying then maybe you need to change some things that doesn't necessarily mean you say it exactly naturally because it's not able to recognize how truly native you sound. What it is able to do is know what you said or not. And if it doesn't recognize what you said, then it tells you where you need to make the changes, right? So you can make those changes and try again, and that's immediate feedback. That's having immediate feedback on how clear your pronunciation is on how well you can be understood. So that is potentially a very powerful thing and I would recommend that as a way to practice. Again, the one I tend to recommend is Otter. Otter is quite good. It's very accurate. It's it's free. It writes down what you say so you can read it later or you can listen back to what you said and compare. For example, if you do one it wasn't very clear, it missed a few, then go back and try it again, you can compare them. So that one's pretty good. Uh, if you have any questions about this, let me know. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. And also check out my full courses in the links in the description. Good question about pronunciation. Which one is correct here? Ring hollow, offend the ear, or grates my ears? Well, they're all they're all correct. Um, to ring hollow means it just doesn't sound true uh, or it doesn't connect with you. You don't feel connected to it. To offend the ear, something is you don't like it, maybe bad music, grates on your ears, um, same, same sort of thing. So two and three are very similar, but number one is different. To ring hollow is different, different meaning. To ring hollow means it's um, more like um, it doesn't resonate. People don't feel a connection with it. Uh, it seems untrue, perhaps, or empty in some way. Can I listen to English through listening to stories or podcasts and just repeat the phrases or words, sentences that the person is saying? Yes, 
um, I would recommend shorter clips. That's a method called shadowing. Shadowing is where you repeat specifically exactly the sounds that you hear. But if you do it with a whole podcast, which is two hours long, that's going to be quite, quite difficult to do um, to continually shadow that long. So I would say take 30 to 40 second clips and then use those for shadowing exercises. Yeah. All right. I think we're going to call it a day today. Um, thank you all for joining. It's been it's been fun. I appreciate all the good questions. Bring your questions for next time. Next week we'll be doing another one of these for sure. Um, as I mentioned before, the for a limited time, the yearly membership is 50% off. If you go to the link in the description, then find the yearly course in the all courses page you can use the coupon code AUTUMN. So put that in the checkout and you'll get 50% off, okay? And that comes with all of the courses presently and in the future. So when I re release new courses, there are six new courses coming out. You'll have access to those as well. So it's a really good deal and right now it's 50% off. And also if you need help along the way, I'm always there to, uh, to help out. So check those out like, subscribe, and I hope to see you all in the next one. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a good, have a good weekend.